Okay. Yay. Hello, world. Um, my name is Christina Carmody, and it's Sunday in Brooklyn. And I have my lovely friend, Tim Nagasawa, is here with me today. And we're going to talk about all the things. So, <laughs> uh, Tim and I met on the Ray Donovan set uh, here in New York. And I uh, just wanted to ask you some questions about your career and where you think our industry is going post COVID and everything in between. Uh, so for anyone that doesn't know you, Tim, uh, do you want to describe kind of how you got into this business? Sure. Uh, particularly into the entertainment industry or into the camera department? I guess both or whatever you find I'll, I'll most you fun to tell. Order. Sure. I'll give you a quick overview. Uh, when I got out of college, I was very lucky and got a job at DreamWorks Animation, which I was there for about a year. And then I found a way to get into Amblin, which is, was a partner of DreamWorks, so Amblin Entertainment, which is Steven Spielberg's company. So I worked at Amblin in the feature production department for about a year and kind of, you know, I knew very, very little about making movies and I kind of got to see how it worked and from a production company standpoint, got to visit a lot of sets, got to talk to a lot of interesting people, directors and producers and actors and creative types. Um, and um, from there, I uh, had a couple of choices. The, my bosses there at Amblin were very, very supportive and kind of uh, asked me what I wanted to do. I said, uh, thinking about, you know, I want to be on set. I know I want to be on set. And so they uh, got me a couple jobs as a set PA and office PA on, let's see, I think Meet the Fockers and Memoirs of a Geisha. And, um, and those were all in LA? Those were all in LA, yeah. And then um, when I was on Memoirs of a Geisha, I was, it was during pre-production. So there was like three months of sitting in an office answering telephones. Yeah. But um, the good thing is that the director of photography, Dion Beebe, was also sharing an office there. And um, one day they asked me if I wanted to start picking, up from, picking him up from his home and driving him to office for a set. I said, yeah, I'd love to. So I got to, you know, I picked him up every day. Um, started talking a little bit, told him I was interested in camera department. And um, once uh, production started shooting, uh, they got me a few days as a camera PA to come down to set and be a camera PA for them, which I loved. It was amazing. And then it just kind of exploded from there pretty much. You know, um, I got my next job on Spider one of the Spider-Man movies as a camera PA. And then I got my union days and then... I started working. Ooh, union strong. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, do you want to share with all the, the fans back home um, a little bit about your experience uh, as a DIT on set and also as a DP on set? Sure. Um, well, recently, what last season on Ray Donovan, I got to do both at the same time. It was wonderful. Um, so, you know, usually as a DAT on, well, on Ray Donovan's very, very unique for me where I have a lot of freedom and a lot of control over what I'm doing at my station and have a lot of say on, in to the kind of look of the show. And it's a, it's a big collaboration, but I do have a voice and I do listen. Uh, sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no, but it's there. Um, and so um, when they allowed me to shoot one of the episodes, um, I also DIT, which was, it was a very, very difficult thing to juggle to do both. Um, but I made it work, but I don't, I don't know if I want it again. But it was, it was great kind of cutting out that, like, you know, cutting out that middleman, like, you know, being the DP and then instantly knowing exactly what I needed to, for, for, you know, the DIT station to make it all work for the lighting and, all those kind of things. Um, Do you look forward to when you can just be DPing and you can like bounce your ideas yes. off the DIT? <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's it's nice to uh, 
not have to worry about all those other things. Um, it'd be nice to, it would have been nice to just spend more time on sets and just concentrate on, you know, lighting and camera and not have to come back to the DAC, DIT station to, you know, um, continue to set it up properly and get everything running and get the color going, get all the metadata and the LUTs going and making sure everyone else gets all their feeds on their iPads and phones and, you know, yeah. directors and stuff like that. Um, but yes, I, I am looking forward to the day where I can just concentrate on shooting. Have you been able to shoot since then? I know uh, no, different. I have not. I've been, I've been for, fortunately, I've been very, very busy just doing DIT work and then, um, and then now, you know, we're, we're in this situation. Yeah. Well, on the, the note of collaborating with DPs, do you want to speak about some of your longest collaborators that you've worked with? Uh, longest, I would say early, early on in my career, I was uh, lucky to get a job working for uh, a DP named Dean Semler. And I went on a run. I read I probably 10, 10 projects with him. Were you ACing um, at the time or as a DIT? I was, it's hard to say. I wasn't, I wasn't DIT. I was doing DIT work. Um, but I didn't know it. It oh. was it was it was during the time of the Genesis when the Gen Panavision Genesis came out, and um, things there was a I would say kind of a I don't know a gray area of you know the equipment and the camera and personnel. Um, so I was doing you know it was a it was a mixture of AC work, camera utility work, and DAT work. I started out with them as a, officially I was like a second assistant and then um, it turned into camera utility and then I was just fully in a tent with Dean at all times, um, making sure the uh, DAT station was up and running properly and I was kind of there to support anything he needed, you know. Um, I did, I mean, I did a lot of work with him. And then um, I would say my newest person I've been collaborating with, um, Rob McLaughlin, I've done, you know, for the past, I don't know, five or six years, a, you know, a ton of projects with him. And it's been, it's been a dream come true, so. Have you found when you meet other people on set that a lot of people as well have kind of like moved along with certain DPs? Or is it, do you feel like you've just been really like lucky and grateful that you, you had the chance to work with a couple guys for a really long period of time? I think it's a mixture of, uh, you know, everyone hopes that they find, you know, their person they could work with forever and be happy with, but it doesn't always work like that. Especially now, things are so much different. It used to, it used to be when I first started, um, you know, you, you get with a crew and you, you stick with them for a long time. Especially like when I first started working like on film, you know, there was definitely a group of guys who I liked working with and I wish I could have worked with them. At the time, I thought, I want to work with these guys forever and just do film and I don't care. I'll just love film for the rest of my life. That'd be great. And things, you know, things, things changed. But I think it's a mixture, you know, some people, I mean, if there was a point where I was bouncing around from DP to DP to DP and, you know, they would all call me, but I was never available. I was just working so much where I was just bouncing everywhere, going, you know, going all over the world and, shooting everywhere and shooting with different people and it was great it was a great experience um but um i do enjoy kind of the studio system of uh having the same crew together and just moving on to project to project do you feel like there have been certain individuals or maybe certain projects that really shaped your career or really you can feel like really shifted it you're like okay now i'm going this way because of that yeah well i mean when I got that first digital job, that kind of blew my mind because I remember when um, I met Dion Beebe on Members of Geisha, and I knew that he had just shot Collateral, which was one of the first major motion pictures shot on things as a Viper camera, on the digital camera. And I just, I could not comprehend how, you know, I was just young and naive. I could not comprehend how somebody could be shooting, a, you know, who could grow up shooting film and then instantly just shoot a digital movie and look so beautiful and amazing, like make that transition. Like this guy is the smartest person ever. Um, and, and then, you know, 
cut to I'm working in film and then I get a job working on a crew that uses the Genesis camera. And I'm just like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know anything about this. You know, I, I'm very familiar with computers and, and, you know, like consumer video cameras, but not with like a professional studio um, digital camera. Um, but I mean, from there, just, I would say that kind of was a turning point of, okay, now I'm just doing digital and it's going to move forward from here. And then I would say the, I think it was a writer's strike like in 2007 where production pretty much shut down for all, all film production shut down and kind of overnight, everyone decided we're going to shoot all the TV shows and as much as possible with um, digital cameras. And I think it was like kind of the red revolution which yeah. kind of exploded like the DAT position and the digital position, digital loaders all across the board. And then I started getting just a ton of, a ton of calls for just being a DAT and digital shows because no one was film had kind of like fallen off the, you know, the radar. Since, I mean, I feel like the, like, I don't know how to describe it, but the, it's weird to say trajectory because it feels like that's like a straight path, but mm -hmm. uh, in the film industry, seeing how everyone was so like beloved and almost um, like precious to film cameras and then everyone switching to digital and now kind of in between um, in that, in that time, have you found it's really interesting when you see people now try to like combine the two? Like, have you been in any productions that have, um, have been shooting both or different, a lot of different formats? Yeah. Uh, not recently, but yeah, when I first started, there were a lot of shows. Uh, when I first started working with Dean, we did a lot of digital and film only because digital cameras couldn't do high speed yet or couldn't do really over 60 frames per second. And we did, you know, doing stunts or any kind of slow motion stuff, we had to bring in high speed film cameras. So. And then as a, a DIT, were you part of the team that would help like smooth that or is that really more of like post and special effects that kind of meshed it all together? No, I mean, um, that's, that's totally a post-production thing. I, I uh, actually, because of where I was in my, in my career, I was helping load film camp, the help loading the film cameras and kind of doing DIT work same time, only because I had knowledge of both, which was, which was fun. But, um, that all that stuff will, was definitely handled in post-production. Gotcha. Um, what else? I had a question for you about, um, I mean, post COVID or I mean, before COVID, um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people just work as much as they can. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in your experience in between projects, have you found certain activities like other than working on films or making films that keep you very like creative or make you feel like you're kind of getting re-inspired to go back on set? Um, as far as creativity, I was a art major in college. So definitely I need that creative outlet from something from somewhere. I do get, you know, in between jobs, I like to decompress and get away from my job. Um, not try not to think about it, even though it's impossible. Um, but I do, you know, it's it's mostly listening to podcasts, uh, going to museums, uh, reading. Um, you know, I do a lot of design work. Um, you know, I design all sorts of sorts of things like stickers and shirts and those kind of things. Um, um, I'm starting to doing. I'm starting to do some um, creative director work for some uh, for a startup company right now which is really helping out a lot. And then, um, and then also, as you know, I exercise a lot, which isn't very, and it's not creative, but you know, it keeps my mind very, very stimulated. Yeah, I, just, I feel like it's interesting to hear how people decompress kind of before all of this into now in a world where you're kind of decompressing all the time. Like how can you be mm -hmm. constantly decompressing? So have you found that some of those activities have shifted now? Like maybe you don't like to do them as much or you've really leaned in. Into yeah, the, the exercise part is, is very difficult right now. Um, so I'm, I'm used to going, to going to the gym every single day and then also on top of that running at least 20 miles a week. And that's not even close to what I'm <laughs> doing now, which is, which is pretty much nothing. 
Um, but I am, I, uh, I am getting a lot of creativity out of me though, doing a lot of design work right now, uh, taking a lot of photos and doing a lot of designing. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Um, have you felt that there have been certain artists, whether they're still photographers or painters or anywhere in between that have really influenced your, I don't know, potential aesthetic in the future as a cinematographer? Um, or just as know. a creative person? Like, yeah. are there certain people that have really, like, I don't know, been huge um, inspiration? I mean, I, in college, I took a lot of art history and art appreciation, appreciation classes, which which I love. Most people don't, but, it, you know, um, as far as like the film industry and lighting, it's, it's very, very beneficial and like color theory, so things like that. So I mean, artists like Caravaggio or like, um, I mean, there's, I mean, it's an endless list of people who I love. I go through, I have this humongous book from college. I think it's called Art of the Ages. And usually when I need inspiration, I'll flip through it. And it's just incredible, incredible wealth of knowledge. And then, you know, there, there are photographers like uh, Martin Parr, who I love very, uh, I would say documentary style, photojournalist type of uh, photography, um, very real life, um, maybe a little satire, but it, uh, I take, get, a, get a lot of influence from his photography. Um, as far as like DPs, like Gordon Willis, has always inspired me. Yeah, um, class. That's kind of a standard, kind of a standard answer. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, Roger Deakins. I, you know, I, I watch anything that he shoots. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was it was cool actually. The other day, I watched uh, another interview with all these DPs talking to each other, and it was kind of funny seeing them. I don't know, just like other animals in the zoo talking about yeah. being in the zoo, and like, and like, yeah. Sometimes it really rains hard on set. <laughs> like it just was funny hearing these guys talk about her and then like acting really like nonchalant you know like at yeah. some point you get in your life and then you just become Roger Deakins and you're like yeah I mean it's hard to say no when they call for you <laughs> you know <laughs> like it's just it was just interesting to you know obviously you see people in different ranges of their career um, yeah. but I don't really think of that too um let's see here uh would you say, are there certain movies that, as someone who works in movies, you really admire that like you can kind of always go back to or? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I, I grew up loving Star Wars. So Star Wars is a very special, you know, place in my heart always. Um, uh, but, you know, I also, you know, I love all Spielberg movies, like growing up and watching Jaws and Indiana Jones. Um, Kurosawa, uh, The Hidden Fortress, um, most of it, you know, any of his movies. Um, Hitchcock, um, I love watching Psycho. Um, Kubrick movies, uh, The Shining really does it for me. I love watching The Shining. Have you watched The Shining since the quarantine though? No, I haven't. Because no. I feel like there, there's certain movies. Yeah, that's that a bad are. movie, that's a yeah. bad quarantine movie. <laughs> yeah, I actually was talking to a friend the other day about watching Wall-E as a quarantine movie. Yeah. What? <laughs> I'm like not showing what happened, but showing how we're going to be afterwards. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, really early on in the quarantine, uh, my boyfriend and I watched um, all the Star Wars movies and all the Indiana Jones, and it was mm -hmm. kind of cool seeing them all together too. I think I think what we watched before, maybe like Lord of the Rings, like seeing all these like big sagas. You know, mm -hmm. and you have all the different memories of when they came out, where you were in the world, and then seeing them all right. together, uh, it's kind of nuts. Yeah. Oh, Back to the Future. I watch a, a lot of Back, Back to the Future. That's a classic. Did you know yeah. that, what's his face? Um, oh my God, I can't remember his name. What's the guy that is Marty McFly? What's the actor's name? Oh, uh, Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Fox, of course. Uh, he wasn't the original Marty. They had right, yeah. that other guy, Eric Stoltz, I think. Yes. They yeah. filmed like a good chunk of that movie. Uh, they, yes, they, they filmed a lot. And then they got in the editing room and saw what they were doing and, like, and made that unbelievable choice to recast him and reshoot. 
which that's would so could never fly wild. today. No, that's just so wild to think that you could go that far and be like, <sighs> like I, I can only yeah. compare to say if we were shooting Ray Donovan and then we're all there with Liev Schreiber and then one day they're like, I don't know, Liev's not really Ray, you know, <laughs> and then just all yeah. of us like, okay, I and guess so, it's yeah. someone Very else. bold choice, but in the end it was the right choice. Totally. Yeah. I guess he knew. I guess Robert Zemeckis knew. He's also done. Yeah, that's another amazing thing about when I worked at Amblin was that all these people that I grew up watching their movies and admired and looked up to were actually there physically. Like I saw Robert Zemeckis on a daily basis, basis saw Steven Spielberg, oh. I saw George Lucas, I saw all, you know, all these creative types coming in and out of the studio at all times. You know, I used to, I had my own office there and John Williams had an office right across from me. And sometimes at lunch, I'd open my window and I could just hear him, whatever he felt like he was composing that day, you know, and listen to him do a live performance. And then also like the tram would go by my office too. Like I just look at my window and the Universal Studios tram would go by my office. So it was a pretty surreal situation for me being that young and being in that situation. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. I don't know how I would have handled that myself <laughs> at that you know really young in your career and seeing all these people and trying to like act really calm <laughs> um would you I, I hate to ask this question but i'm going to ask this question what do you think our industry is going to look like when we can reopen and work again i think it's going to be a struggle of making everyone feel safe and happy especially like and we have to jump through a lot of hoops for like insurance companies and bond companies and production companies and also, you know, actor and crew safety. So it's going to be difficult to get through all that at first, but it's going to be a lot of restrictions uh, and they'll figure out how to deal with a skeleton, probably like a skeleton crew shooting minimal scenes, minimal locations, minimal interactions, everyone's spread out. Um, not that people don't already spread out and hide on set anyways, but it'll be even more. And then slowly get back into how it is. I think it'll, it will get back to the way it was. It's just going to take a little bit of time, a little bit of patience. And, you know, people are going to start bending the rules and, you know, being a little reckless to get things done. And hopefully it doesn't get, get out of hand. Um, my worry is that, you know, the whole filmmaking process will hopefully won't get lost. You know, we lost a big part of the filmmaking process when digital started. And I hope that this new situation that we're in when we get back to set is that we don't lose, you know, more of that. Because we'll never get it, get it back. Once, once we start rolling and things are, you know, we're overlooking things and not going through the process we were, it's just gonna get completely lost and don't ever come back. And then, you know, people are gonna learn that way production companies are going to expect us to do it that way. And, you know, producers are going to be like, well, this is the way we were doing it. It was working. So. Do you feel part of that has to do with how directors and cinematographers really like lead the sets and really kind of help corral people and focus people? Um, I think, uh, yep. Yep. Partly. I think, you know, cinematographers definitely are trying to hold on to, that process as much as possible. And a lot of directors are too. Um, and, but you know, there's only so much they can do, you know, they have to get their day. They have, you know, they have to, you know, shoot what needs to be shot with what's yeah. given to them. I know it's just funny because I was just thinking about all the times on set, we, we try so hard to be efficient and be fast and be, yeah. um, what's the word, just almost like really close. Like we're always trying to be like, who can get so, who can get the closest to set? Like how can I, my, our gear get this much? And I'm just True. curious if that's gonna be like, we're like, okay, how do you stay socially distant or six feet apart when you're trying to fit? You know, even like when you're shooting on, um, just on like a street of New York or a street of LA and we're all trying to like keep our ducks in a row, but I'm not sure how we're supposed to keep our ducks okay. in a row now. I mean, how often do you see like my DAT cart like right on the edge of frame? Like <laughs> always. Always. <laughs> or like right in front of the bathroom or right in front of the only exit to the, you know, to whatever location we're at. It's always right there. 
Oh, I have to say that's been my, one of my new favorite quarantine activities is watching uh, shows and spotting uh, edge or like Haddad trucks. Um, oh, just yeah. like in the background of certain scenes for anyone who doesn't know, but like all the trucks that have all of our gear in it. And every now and again, they'll do maybe this like really like scenic shot of New York City or something. And then you just like see a Haddad's truck go like get onto the BQE or like see mm -hmm. something and you know, because they maybe they just went to a bodega or they like just entered a shop. Mm -hmm. and you can see it in the background and it's been like a new like, oh, oh remember that time we used to. Yeah use trucks yeah <laughs> um, yeah yeah actually were you what were you working on right as they called like cut on all of us were you like on a project in la no i wasn't i was actually in the middle of well at the end of training for a big race in san jose and um i was forget the date but literally they canceled it the day before the race for everything and that was like the turning points for me and for you know I guess the nation of everything being shut down and I was kind of debating because I was I was going to do the race for sure um even though there was this you know this big scare um but it didn't seem quite as real at that point yet and then I started thinking, well, I don't know if this is going to be safe at all. And then luckily they canceled it right before mm. the day, the day before the race. And then that was like the realization hit, hit me for sure. Like this is not going to be good. Yeah. It was wild. I'm not sure if I actually told you, but I was working on uh, a new show for Amazon, which was, we kept slating as an untitled project. So who knows what it's going to be called. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, um, I think only shot three episodes uh, out of 10. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, what was it, March 13th or March 12th, uh, we were shooting somewhere in New York and our Friday was supposed to be at a community college. And we were supposed to have like an additional 300, 400 background filling up this big, you know, kind of like classic auditorium to make look like Columbia, but we're in some random school. Uh, and it was pretty wild to, you know, we had a, a safety meeting on set. And this representative, I imagine from NBC or something, like every now and again, you have like a safety rep come to set, but they're never really around all the time. But that last week he was there every day, multiple times a day. And then they stopped, we were in the middle of a steady cam shot. And we, before we shot, they were like, we're gonna have a safety meeting right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, not about the shot. Like, again, I, don't, you, I hope that people watch us know about sets, but if people don't know about sets, you know, we have a certain rhythm in our day of what shots we're gonna do. And, you know, we have a call sheet that says all of the, the different things we plan. And mm -hmm. you don't really have a point where you plan to have a, like a whole set meeting. Sometimes it's just at the top of the day. Like, hey, we're gonna do some stunts. Things could explode. Don't stand next to the explosions, you know? But we didn't really have a moment to say, hey, let's talk about the upcoming global pandemic. But yeah, so this guy comes on, uh, we stop all what we're doing, and he says, you know, what protocols they are working on, other things other sets are doing. And mm -hmm. it was it was calm at first, and then people started asking questions, and the poor guy just couldn't answer them. He's just like, I'm just the middleman. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not NBC. I'm, I'm not coronavirus. I'm just someone who's telling you to wash your hands and clean your mm -hmm. gear as much as possible. And they're like, but how are we supposed to clean all of our gear and go on location? And like, we're ready a crew of 200 something people and now mm -hmm. have an extra 400 people. And it got a little nuts. And then our like UPN was like, okay, good talk. Let's go back to work. <laughs> like, uh, okay. So we just, finished the rest of the day steady cam because why not you know yeah, oh it's gonna be so much faster so, so everything then people started going just crazy fast uh then we start loading up our truck and some poor pa has the task to tell us that they need to collect all of our walkies right now while we're loading our truck mm -hmm. uh, and also that we're indefinitely shut down so, yeah. and then of course, just like a classic New York day, started 
downpouring while we're loading our camera truck and they're asking us for our walkies. Uh, <laughs> and then it was a Thursday. So, you know, some of the camera systems then had to do the whole week's worth of paperwork because then they told mm -hmm. us that we we're shut down that night and we weren't going to work on Friday. Mm -hmm. So actually that day in March, we fully loaded the camera truck with all of our personal gear and our rented Panavision gear and then locked the door and it's been locked ever since. <laughs> like no one can get into our truck. It's like really nuts. It's just yeah. kind of wild every now and again. The, my coworkers from that job will talk about it. Like we kind of got free storage, but it's also <laughs> weird that it's just in some parking lot in Greenpoint. Yeah. I think, I think actually our DIT asked to maybe get his personal stuff off it like that next day. And they're like, mm -hmm. we legally can't open it. Like they're not letting a Teamster open the truck. Yeah. So everyone's. Yeah, it's, it's very strange times. Yeah. I just remember that being just really such a bizarre circumstance of like being on something that's going full speed. You know, like all these plans, all these episodes, all this stuff to halting and then just our life's been on pause the past two months. Uh, so we'll see whenever we get the word that we can get our stuff again. But that was my last day of work. Yeah. Um, I haven't thought about it in a while, but I thought I'd mention it. <laughs> um, well, I want to thank you for your time, Tim. Of course. Because I'm really excited to talk to more people from the comforts of my own home. <laughs> it's safe to talk to people. Uh, and maybe if there's so much followers and likes on this video, when I do so many more videos, I can have you back on and you can be like, whoa, you talked to so many people. Let me tell you more things about my career. <laughs> Um, do you have anything else you'd like to tell the world? Oh, I, I don't know. I would say <laughs> as far as the entertainment industry, um, you know, we're going to figure a way to make it work. Uh, hopefully we don't lose that energy because a lot of what we do is feeding off other people's creativity, especially in the camera department and getting energy from, you know, our fellow uh, camera, you know, camera people. Uh, especially with like a cinematographer and director relationship, you feed off each other's energies and ideas. And if you can't be close to each other and you have to be separated, you know, you're going to lose that. Um, so hopefully we can get back to normal. We'll see what the new normal is when we get there. <laughs> well, thanks for your time, Tim. I'm going to stop recording and then maybe we can keep saying goodbye when we're not recording. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs>